Navigating the ever-changing landscape of edtech can be hard, especially if you're doing it alone. And that's why we're honored to have interdisciplinary collaboration expert Aaron Klein join us in the edtech lounge. Aaron is an award-winning elementary teacher, keynote speaker, author, and a member of Scholastic's top teaching team. Aaron is certified in Brain Gym and serves as the design consultant with Carson DeLosa. She was a featured speaker on Future Ready Schools at the National Digital Learning Day in Washington, D.C. Aaron has recently published a book called Amazing Grades in collaboration with experts from 13 different countries. So welcome, Aaron. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here and to just share all about education. You have a background not just in teaching, but also in interior design as well. That's correct. So prior to going into teaching, I actually started out in with interior design. One of the things that I've learned so much is just the impact that intentional design has on learning spaces today. So it's not just creating, you know, beautiful classrooms that might look good, um, but it's really creating brain friendly learning environments that enhance the pedagogical practices that the teacher implements within the classroom. Can you help me understand, you, you talked about, you know, it not just being this aesthetic thing, but there's this functional brain component. So can you expand on that a little bit? One of the studies that we really liked a lot and kind of paid close attention to was put out by Carnegie Mellon. And it was done in regards to attention to allocation. And it really struck me just because being a full-time classroom teacher, knowing the student makeup of uh, groups of learners that I have in here and the mm -hmm. need for differentiation and personalized learning. And so oftentimes teachers think that their rooms need to be covered with all of this environmental print from floor to ceiling and right, right like the teacher store exploded <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. just everything is everywhere. But you can imagine, and this is, it can be really intimidating and overwhelming and overstimulating to a lot of the groups of learners. And just thinking in terms of, for example, um, ADHD, and CDC put out, I think it was in 2011, um, that 11% of our learners have ADHD. So you can imagine just mm. that high magnitude of kids in our classrooms. And we really need to kind of think about minimalistic environments and keeping everything eye level, especially if it's supposed to be a resource for the students. What do people do to achieve a balance between having too much stuff and having not enough? One of the first things that we always do is consult with our clients. And in the education world, so often do we consult with our clients, which are our students. Oftentimes, you know, they're our largest stakeholder. And whenever we think about designing learning spaces, teachers do it in the summer before they even meet their groups of kids. So I think it's really important to kind of just hold off. And it's okay to not be perfectly ready on day one because you need to kind of create your environment together with the kids. You should be able to walk into a space and determine if it's a history classroom versus a science lab or a language arts classroom filled with literature and books and, you know, to really ignite that enthusiasm for reading. So I think it's important to be able to have certain artifacts out, but to just be intentional, like I said, um, pay attention to lighting, trying to avoid the overhead fluorescence, bringing things eye level for students and what you have on display, not necessarily having it out all year long but one of the greatest examples that I always give is for example Barnes and Noble when mm -hmm. you walk in especially to the kids area it's not the same all year long they change it when mm -hmm. a season changes or if a new movie comes out that was the first of a book and so they highlight certain things throughout the year and the brain research shows that you know our brains seek novelty and when anything changes you know are everything lights up and you pay attention to that. You mentioned kind of rates of ADHD and stuff like that. So what is it that we really need to to help people, you know, get focused on say curriculum or, or content? I think that yes, students can absolutely get overstimulated by technology and devices, but I also think that sometimes we underestimate their capabilities and we don't just have to teach to the middle um, the the traditional way teacher in front of the classroom i think that there's so many things and what's most important is that the students are in the driver's seat and that they are the ones being hands-on with their learning experience and taking part in it i think no matter the the methodology of instruction it's most important that the kids are the ones kind of taking charge of the learning. Is this related to uh, brain gym or educational kinesiology? What is that, by the way? I I've never heard of brain gym or educational kinesiology. It sounds like such an interesting concept to me. It's fascinating. In fact, um, I was very fortunate my first year of teaching a principal where I originally started out. She introduced it to me and our whole school was a brain gym school. Educational kinesiology 
kinesiology is movement in the classroom. You need for blood to be flowing and your red blood cells, you know, to have oxygen and the kids need movement. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of research about crossing the midline and the body. So whether it's getting up and doing you know, cross crawls of getting the right side and the left side to kind of cross the midline and activating both hemispheres of the brain to just kind of get more tuned in. Or there are a variety of different simple activities that you can even do in your seat and even just before you say something really important just kind of calling the group together and just you know having them kind of touch there's a lot of sensory um parts on the like, ears so even touching just their ears kind of touch from the top down like if you're ready to listen fingers on top of the ears and let's touch all the way down hands in your lap and when you're ready eyes on me and it's just more of a movement to kind of become an active listener for what's about to follow, not having a 60 minute lecture, but having something that's, you know, five to 15 minutes and then having some sort of kinesthetic type transition, even if it's just getting up and doing, you know, the simple cross crawls really quickly. Just touching my ear just uh, before makes me feel like I'm already more ready to listen. I, I love these like little things that you can kind of do in your seat. In some of the books you say like 13 different countries, how do you connect with all these people all over the world? I don't imagine you're traveling to, to each each individual site. And when I did the classroom design book, we did kind of like how we're doing, uh, Skyping with one another, a lot of collaborative documents, whether it was Google Docs, a lot of Hangouts online, face-to-face -face mm -hmm. conferencing, and just picking up the phone as well and just connecting to kind of bounce ideas. Have you found any, any tips or tricks for people who are trying to collaborate over distance, say in their classroom? One of the, the best ways is social media. So for example, Twitter has been instrumental in allowing me to be able to connect with different teachers. So for example, there are so many chats that you can get involved with as an educator. Whether you teach a foreign language, there's a chat for that. If you teach second grade, there's a chat for that. If you teach high school physics, there's a chat for that. Um, there are even state chats held on certain nights of the week at a certain time. And there's a level of a consistency with those. So you mm -hmm. can always plan, for example, on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, there's going to be you know, X chat. You have a global network of teachers who are all collaborating together with the vast web at your fingertips as an archive of resources. So just sharing links, sharing resources, sharing stories, sharing mm -hmm. conference ideas. You've connected for so many weeks throughout the year. And then finally, you maybe plan to meet up at a face-to-face -face conference. And mm -hmm. just that brings everything to a whole new level. I mean, I have chills just thinking about it. I remember my first year of teaching, I got involved with New Teacher Chat, led mm -hmm. by Lisa Tabs. And she was in California and I was in Michigan. And she kind of took a tremendous amount of teachers under her wing who were all new teachers and kind of mentored us. And it was so great that I was, you know, not afraid anymore to ask questions as a new teacher because everyone on this chat had similar questions. I feel like I grew the most that first year of teaching than I have in my entire teaching career. And then I wow. finally got to meet Lisa face to face at the International Technology Conference that was in San Diego. I flew out there and mm. I was actually on a panel with her and a group of educators and I was the new teacher perspective just speaking to how social media can really enhance the educational practice and it was life-changing. The interest in like any classroom you mentioned each class is just so diverse so how do you how do you constantly adapt to all the different people in your class? I think knowing your students and what might work best uh, allows you to scale most importantly so mm -hmm. I might have four or five kids that I know can just consume content at such a high level and who could probably already teach so I'm able to connect them with some sort of online adaptive type program for that 15 minutes while I'm giving the mini lesson so for example mm -hmm. if we're learning about fractions I can have them learning about fractions at a sixth grade level instead of the third grade level I'm teaching at. And then when it's time to do after that five to 15 minute kind of mini lesson, um, when we break off into different groups, I can then work with them on some sort of more hands-on type project at a much higher level. How do we go and build that effective you know, storytelling among students? Having a kid do a short, you know, 30 second commercial about themselves, like something on via Animoto or iMovie or there's variety of different applications or sites that students can create these videos on a commercial about them. And then it wouldn't take a teacher long at all to watch a 30 second video about a right. child to just kind of get that much closer to them after the school day. When you kind of teach 
writing through a workshop type process approach, I think it makes a big difference for students. When it comes to like early childhood education, um, have you found that like, w have you found an impact that multi-touch has had on, you know, on learners and their ability to kind of express themselves or learn about those modes of expression earlier? Any sort of multi-touch sensory environment, they are all instantly gravitating. It's they want to be the doers and they want to try and fail and try again and fail. And, you know, it's more of that process or prototype type learning that we really want to see in upper elementary and high school and so on. And I think our youngest learners do it best. Can you give us some examples of like some of the the stuff that people have said they really appreciated from, from your blog? I did a blog for Scholastic, for example, on how to set up digital workstations. So it's how to personalize learning in the classroom environment by using technology to kind of give immediate corrective feedback and increase student engagement and personalize the learning environments. So um, that post is, I think, like a 3,000 word post. It's really lengthy, <laughs> but a embedded links, a lot of vid video examples of me and doing classroom practice, a lot of pictures from my own classroom. And so I think that's been the most helpful is whenever you can give real examples. It was great to have the opportunity to chat with you today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Have a great day.